So I would now like to invite up Dr. Peter Walter Werner, uh, the director for the UAEU National Water Centre. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Werner is going to be the moderator for the next session, and it is understanding the impact of water on energy supply, both for power generation and oil production processes. Dr. Werner. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, opportunity to discuss here this uh, uh, issues, this, this topic. This means uh, understanding of the impact of water on energy supply both for power regeneration and oil production processes. I think these are different items, different issues. We, it's very hard to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to do this. And therefore, from this point of view, I want to invite uh, panelists who are here. This is Mr. Ahmed Mohad. Dr. Ahmed Morat. He is the uh, Vice Dean of the uh, College of Science in the UAEU, University, University of the Emirates here in Al Ain. And he is a specialist in the field of water by, um, from his, uh, um, his education or his background. He is a hydrogeologist. Perhaps you come up and sit to the front here. And then I have uh, Dr. Griffiths from MASTA. He is also a very well-known expert in the field of water. And so from this point of view, please come up and sit down. And then I also want to invite Dr. Basam Hasbini, and he is the managing director of LEAD Consult here in the UAE. And uh, I think it is very difficult now to combine those both uh, issues here. And you also have some questions, I think, in the program, which are related more or less to desalination or saline water. And this is more or less another issue which we have to discuss here. But I think perhaps uh, I don't want to, no, to direct the, uh, this discussion to a special field. I think let's uh, have two minutes for each panelist to give an, not an, uh, some, some remarks, I would say. Okay. <coughs> Thank Please, you, Ahmed. Peter, you for start. your introduction uh, in this uh, panel. As you mentioned, that's the link between the energy and the water is a big issue nowadays in the uh, water sector. We know that the water and the wa water and energy are linked uh, together, together at different level from the policy makers level, scientists, and I think other I think entities that involve in both uh, sectors. Uh, for example, the first priority for uh, for the policy or for the policy makers of the water is to have wise and efficient use of the water with what with the available supply of energy. However, also the first priority even for the policy makers of the energy is to have efficient and wise use of energy with availability of the water. So in general that the availability of the water is important and controlling the type of energy that can even be used uh, to produce uh, water. A big issue in this uh, water and energy, let's say, Nexus is the financial resources. All the uh, countries, governmental organization, looking to develop uh, technologies, either conventional or non-conventional, uh, to be wisely in terms of the, uh, uh, let's say, financial uh, resources, with financial uh, resources, and this issue can be even coped with the strong or enhanced the part, uh, uh, partnerships between the governmental entities and private uh, sector with the academia and with other industry uh, uh, sectors. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here today. So I've always been intrigued in the, by the power and water sector in the Gulf because it's so strongly coupled. Particularly when we look from a strategic perspective in the UAE, you see that uh, much of the power we generate is actually coupled to the water that we consume. And this causes a challenge because if you can see an optimally running uh, thermal cogeneration plant, 
where you're having both the power and the water produced, you look at something called the power to water ratio. And so typically, as we've done our modeling of the energy system of the UE, and we've looked at the other uh, energy systems of other countries in the Gulf, we've looked at this ratio when you're running optimally in power production and water production together, something on the order of 10 to 15, being the number of megawatts you can produce relative to the number of millions of imperial gallons that you can produce per day. Now that's great when you're running full out in power production and water is, is fairly consistent for you, say in the summer months. But as we try to model this and we try to think about how this impacts the broader system, the winter comes and we think, okay, the water is going to be, as you know, uh, typically used at a very similar type of rate, maybe 70% of what may be the peak uh, when it's hotter, but the power drops off considerably. And so how does this plant run? How does this uh, optimal energy system come together? It's a challenge because your power plant has to start running at a very low utilization. In the UAE, sometimes we see that going down somewhere around the level of 30%. So your, your power production relative to your water production becomes much less, and that creates inefficiencies in the system. So as we've thought about energy system evolution, we've continued to think, how can, for at least from the Mazda perspective, how can this energy water nexus be done in a clean and sustainable way? And so we've been considering, when this country starts to transition more into the nuclear and photovoltaics and such, decoupling of the power and water system, looking at more of the membrane electricity driven uh, generation technologies for clean water production and to be coupled with your clean power production sources whether it's nuclear or renewables. So on that side of it we see a great opportunity for uh, a energy and water system evolution which is highly sustainable. When you get into the sort of the challenges we have with the recovery of our hydrocarbon being the second point of the topic, it's again looking at the water quality of the Gulf, it's very saline. Uh, it's got many salts of uh, calcium and sodium and sulfates, so it becomes another challenge in a little different context of how you clean that up in a low-cost way. And I know that one of my colleagues here will talk about the produced water, but when you look at the seawater, whether for its primary recovery or secondary recovery, uh, maybe water flooding applications, there's a cost to that. Uh, we believe that you potentially could have a cleanup technology on a dollar per barrel basis, which is somewhere 10 to 12 cents. Produced water, however, is a bigger challenge. And so with these oil fields producing water and oil and gas, I think that's a question we're still trying to answer in this uh, broader nexus discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Bassam, please. Uh, I think uh, Stephen actually introduced my topic quite well. Actually, I want to talk about uh, what, I, what I call uh, the water of the rich which is water produced with the oil, along oil production. It's called produced water. Now, the, uh, worldwide, the average water produced per barrel of oil, we have three barrels of water produced for each barrel of oil. In countries like Oman, this ratio can become 10, 10 barrels of water for each barrel of oil produced. And as oil wells age and become you know, uh, older in, uh, into the production, uh, we get more and more water. Now, this water is problematic in that it's quite often polluted and highly saline. What happens is that uh, oil companies have been uh, going away, I mean, have been injecting most of this water into aquifers, whether for, you know, enhanced oil recovery or for, uh, you know, uh, pressure equalization or even just disposal. Now, worldwide, uh, in, in terms of worldwide, dispo uh, you know, the fate of this wor water worldwide, 95% of this water is actually injected, whether disposal or just pressure equalization. And only 5% is considered for other uses, for either evaporation, and maybe a very small percentage is used for beneficial use. Now, what prevents this water from being beneficially used uh, is a combination of factors, and uh, mainly it's, it's uh, really the level of pollutants that are found in this water. Now, this water can be quite saline. TDS can vary all the way from 100 milligrams per liter all the way to 400,000 milligrams per liter ppm. So it's, it's when it becomes a brine, uh, at the brine level, it becomes very challenging to, to, uh, to clean or to, to, to treat and reuse. However, uh, there's another factor actually, is that uh, oil companies really are used to injection and you know, the beneficial use of this water is not really considered amongst their core activities. That's why there hasn't been much you know, focus on trying to reuse this water. Worldwide, we have about 32 million cubic meters of produced water on a daily basis. And uh, to give you an example, for instance, in Oman, we have like 600,000 cubic meters of produced water 
on a daily basis. In Kuwait, 150,000, around 100, a little bit less than 150,000. Luckily, here in the UAE, it's quite less because you know the oil uh, wells are, are uh, you know, of uh, better production than, than elsewhere. But uh, you know, there was an, a case I was involved in myself where this water has been treated biologically and reused, and. It, it was quite beneficial. However, you know, to change the mindset of oil companies, uh, directors, to try to reuse this water took about eight years. I mean, the pilot succeeded in 2002. It was put into production, or it was the water that was produced was reused beneficially in maybe in 2010. So there was a gap trying to convince that this water is actually a resource. It's not really a waste to be you know, disposed of. Basically, this is, this is my, my, uh, my contribution to this uh, topic. Uh, Thank you very much, very much for your contributions now. And so we cover a whole variety <coughs> and even much more than is written here in the topic. And uh, so we, if we have the financial issues uh, also mentioned. You mentioned also uh, renewable energy and uh, no, 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 see, uh, the classical energy and ecology is also uh, you uh, was uh, addressed and essentially uh, about the high salinity, which is also a big issue here. And essentially, and uh, last uh, uh, panelist talking about this injection and uh, also the, uh, the water which is uh, produced uh, during the oil uh, during the uh, the oil production. You have uh, such used waters which has to be cleaned. Anyway, and so we need, uh, it's, it's an ecological uh, problem uh, and essentially in the, in the water problem. And uh, I think now I want to open the discussion to the, uh, to the audience now and then we can try to find uh, or to focus and stress one special issues in this field. Are there any contributions or questions or um, additional remarks in any field you want to do? Are there any, is there anything? Please go uh, raise your hand. My problem is, it is very, I don't really see the audience that, that much. And so, that's fine. Now I see it better. Is there something which could, which could now enhance the discussion here? Uh, it's, it's actually a very good topic, especially for the impact of the water for the energy production. So I just want to know that, let's say, uh, if we use some DI water, so what are the techniques? Those are the more, you can say, the cost efficient and also the environment friendly to produce the water to use in the power sector and all this. Who wants? Well, I can say a few things about the different techniques and what kind of quality of water they produce. So when we look at the, the what's really one of the very interesting things about the, the thermal uh, water production is it creates a very, very pure water. So when you look at the, uh, the, the quality of that water, it comes out around 10 ppm, which is very, very good. It's actually far less than what you need for drinkable water. In the desalination, you see, and you, you also, but you get a slightly lower recovery of the water when you're doing the thermal method. So 25% or so of the total water that you're bringing in, the saline water being, you know, coming out at that quality is what you see. When you start to decouple the system, there has been historically some consideration that it may be a challenge to get the levels of water quality you need using membrane technologies, reverse osmosis, or what have you. Now, the, it's, uh, what we can see now is that when you're doing, say, a one-pass one uh, reverse osmosis technique, you can get below 500 ppm, which is roughly what you need to achieve, you know, maybe a little bit lower than that for drinkable water. You also can remove a lot of the impurities which typically are considered uh, a challenge. Um, historically, boron was the big problem. Now the specifications, I think, from the World Health Organization have risen a bit. So as we start to look at technology development for second pass or cleanup of the purified water from, say, a reverse osmosis operation, with some of the partners we're working with, they're asking us to look at technologies which maybe can remove uh, residual chlorine. So it's now different types of challenges in the water purification process. It's not necessarily the salinity when you get past the first stage or what have you, which is, you know, 40%, you know, that would be ambitious, maybe a little lower than that with, with reverse osmosis recovery of your, of your water. But looking at what you're going to do to get out any types of cleanup you need of the residual chemicals or impurities which make the water further potable. Thank you for this contribution. Somebody else who wants to contribute here? No. 
I think this is uh, the, uh, to talk about the technologies for cleaning is very important, uh, and also uh, this is also a financial issue. How much we uh, um, how how much uh, depollution de we can afford, and sometimes this is also discussion with the regulators and uh, the guidelines. I don't know if there are any guidelines in this field and how they can be controlled. And I think in the oil industry we also should consider. Uh, other pollutions, uh, I don't want to uh, go to another item, but when you look uh, worldwide, refinery process and all these things, you also have a contamination in the groundwater. This also has to con be considered in this oil production processes here. And um, this is another issue when you go to the uh, sea, you also have might have pollution here in the sea, which also might have an impact on the desalination plants. Mm. This is also something which we have to consider and have to protect it. This is something which you have to uh, discuss too. Any other contributions, ideas, and questions to the specialists in front of us, of you? It's not the case, but I want to in, oh, <laughs> just try another <laughs> issue. For example, when we talk about uh, power uh, as an energy supply, we also need uh, cooling systems. And uh, this is also very pure water, okay, we need pure water, but the cooling system also has big problems worldwide. I don't know if we have uh, this um, uh, problem also was addressed here. When you have cooling towers, you have a, sometimes a hygienic problem because you also have a lot of bacteria growing in this cooling tower water and this are, is a a spray and which is uh, moving in the in the air and so you might inhale it and there are special bacteria worldwide uh, this is um, we have this problem in the UK we had it in Europe we had it in, Fr in France and uh, UK belongs to Europe for sure. Also in France, UK and Germany, I know it by heart. You have uh, Legionella, and this is a, a lung disease, and a lot of uh, dead people, uh, uh, or a lot of uh, infections we had, and also when people are not very resistant, they die. I don't know about this issue here in the country. I would li uh, like to learn more about it, and uh, if this problem exists here too. Is there somebody who is acquainted to this issue? Well, I'll just make a comment on the, yeah, on, the, on, the on the top. <laughs> I'm not a chemist in cooling tower technology and what, but I, I would say on the on the issue of you know the uh, the uh, thermal electrical energy production and the need for cooling. I mean, it is a significant problem. And we, we've seen in the, in the Gulf, for instance, when you have you know it's not so much in the UE. I'll, I'll be honest with you, but when you look at having to use uh, cooling in condensers, for instance. You know, you've got to look at the uh, ways in which you're going to do it. So there's an open loop and there's a closed loop way of doing cooling. There's also uh, open and closed loops way of doing the power production. But in the cooling system, I would say, you know, the uh, water extraction or abstraction when you're going to try to avoid the types of challenges you see when you discharge high temperature water into the Gulf or into other bodies of water, which is, you know, being looked down, down upon right now, is significant. So you first have to ensure that you have a level, a level of water quality that's consistent with whatever materials are for your condensing. If you're going to do internal recirculation where you're going to use the cooling tower, for instance, then it's a matter of trying to understand what levels of water quality are required to have an efficient cooling tower operation. And so there's some of the things that we're aware of from other types of modeling is when you look at this question of the saline water, you cannot have, uh, regardless of what level of, 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 um, of uh, microbiological issues you might want to make sure are purified out before you start doing the cooling process, the high salinity does it has a reduction in the vapor pressure of the water, and so that reduces significantly the efficiency of the cooling operation if you're trying mm -hmm. to use seawater, for instance. So the, when you start to do the purification, one of the design principles is to think about the amount of penalty you'll take and the efficiency of the cooling tower based on the salinity. So it's like something like 10,000 ppm, every uh, 10,000 ppm salinity of the water in the cooling tower reduces efficiency about 1%. So those are the kind of issues that you would look at, that we would look at. Additionally, the materials, um, as you know, whenever you're having aqueous solution and next to metals and such, you don't want to have uh, either a uh, corroding or a scaling environment, mm. right? So you need to look at the types of, so you want the pH not to be too low so that you can avoid the issues with uh, corrosions. And if you have the pH too high, then too high or you have 
um, some metals, salts, or what have you, you might get the scaling. Mm -hmm. So there's a water purification that's required regardless of what you're going to do when you're going through those internal recirculation, which is the way most of these operations are moving now because discharge of high temperature water into, uh, or into the bodies of water, which we're trying to maintain environmentally friendly, is seen to be looked down upon. It's also a matter of the materials you use, since this is a corrosion and water quality. Right, so the water quality yeah. impact on yeah. the thermal uh, yeah. electrical power production is really, mm -hmm. it's a matter of corrosion, scaling. Those are two major problems that you'd see either in the cooling flow or if you're going to be using the makeup water and the, mm -hmm. and the uh, steam, if you're using steam cycle, say, in a, in a, uh, in a uh, combined cycle type of plant. Okay, thank you. Ahmed? I maybe shift a little bit to other topic, I think yes. that <laughs> might be interested to me and other. So if we look to all over the world and even the nations over, or over the world, they are now uh, developing uh, energy options and policies that led to at the end to sustain the energy resources and very important. So in order to sustain the energy uh, resources, you need to, I think, uh, look to other option, other uh, maybe you can combine between conventional water, uh, conventional and uh, innovative technologies in order to meet the efficient uh, use of both resources, of energy resources and even the water uh, resources. Here, for example, if we look in Abu Dhabi here, we have Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week. So this is the key issue, sustainability. We need to sustain these resources for the future. For example, in the United States, uh, in USA, uh, especially I, I think it's in New York, so I think the groundwater uh, decreasing in some um, times, and that led, I think, to reduce the energy in some areas uh, uh, or district uh, in the USA. So that's a big challenge. So we need, I think, to sustain uh, these resources in order uh, to have uh, for future generation and that will lead to combine between the efficiency and wise use of the uh, uh, of the resources. Yeah. That's good. Thank you for this contribution. Essentially this directly to this remarks. If yes, please. Uh, I just want to add in uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmad uh, Murad uh, discussion that he mentioned that the sustainability, so because uh, we also need to consider the impact on the environment as uh, Dr. Stephen mentioned that the RO, single pass and double pass treatment. So we also need to see what is the impact of the pre-treatment chemicals, those are injecting into the process and at the end it, it again sent back to the sea. I also visited yesterday the Mazdar Institute stall. They are also investigating the impact of the chemicals on the marine life. But in, in normal discussion, normally this topic is neglected. They only discuss the, the, the good picture side, but they don't show the, the ugly side of this, this the treatment process. Of course, for the state sustainability, this should be the, like a water, energy, and environmental uh, nexus that we need to consider for the future sustainability of the water supply, especially for the industrial water. Thank you. I think when we say that I think efficient use of the resources, that I think uh, implies I think environmental issues. So I, I know that I think if we used uh, um, many I think technologies or many process has impact on the environments. In the meantime, I think we need, uh, I think there is a lot of research requires in order to improve such technology. Uh, nowadays we are I think cope with the shortages uh, in the water by I think desalinated water, by treated waste water. In the meantime, I think there is huge efforts, I think, by different entities, by governments, by scientists, I think, uh, and tackle these issues. So again, the environment efficiency, uh, efficiency and environmental issues is very important, I think, in the decision makers. Decision makers, I think, consider that the environmental issues with the efficient use of the resources. At the end, I think we need to sustain the resources. We don't need to secure the resources for like one, two, two three years, five years. No, we need to look for the beyond that. 
for the I think economy development for the I think for the if, uh, for the if it, for economic develop, um, economic developments and development of the nation now it is. Thank you very much, and I think I just want to contribute here, and I think uh, this needs an integrated water resources management, which is, should be a closed loop, mm -hmm. and this is most, most important. And you cannot just tackle one problem or solve one problem, and you might by, uh, create more problems or other problems by solving one problem in a special way. This also has to be considered for the future, I think. Yes. Okay, you want to contribute? I was going to say that's a, yeah, that's a very good point to make is that when you're looking at the, um, the water purification process, so you get, there's the pre-treatment, then there's the primary treatment, the post-treatment. And so to think about what the, when we're talking about the costs, we're talking about the environmental impacts, you know, it's a, it's a challenge that we have to consider. So everyone knows about membrane technologies, reverse osmosis, but when you're going to be using, say, the Gulf water quality, which is very high total dissolved solids, you know, it's very turbid water, it's hot water. You, know, you have to do a lot of pretreatment, and that's a cost that we have to bear when we're going to do pure water production using, say, a reverse osmosis or forward osmosis, or whatever maybe the technique. Additionally, on the back end, you have to worry about the brine, and that's another environmental issue. Is so, how do you find the proper technology that deals with very, very, very saline brine, 60,000 ppm and above? You can't use another passive reverse osmosis because the pressures would be too high. You can't. So you look at things like membrane distillation, new technology, which themselves have fouling. So when we, when we start to put together, say, a program, try to understand the economics of you know, clean water production, if it's going to be membrane technology-based, the total water cost, which we, you know, we're pushing the state of the art on a dollar, dollar per meter cubic basis, would be something around maybe 150 with the water qualities that we have in trying to pre-treat and post-treat. Whereas if you look in a textbook, you'll see the reverse osmosis today in seawater or 50 cents per cubic meter or what have you. So I think the economics, the challenges, the environmental pieces of it, it's a holistic picture. So that was a very important point to, uh, to consider in this discussion. Thank you very much. Now I see that we still have four minutes and I have one crucial question which is coming uh, from the audience. I don't know from where, but I have it on my tablet. And I want to, you to stress this question. This is a crucial one. What is, the question is, what is the estimated additional cost for treating cis produced water? This is, uh, for produced water means, I think, uh, water. Also, I think you should contribute to this question. Also, this question means, what is the estimated uh, additional cost for treating cis produced water? So we have I mean, this, this, is, this, is, so actually, this is actually a, a, a wide question. I mean, it really depends on the water quality. And, and uh, you know, for treating produced water, you are talking mainly about, initially you're talking about de-oiling, a, a, a process of just removing the hydrocarbons, the, the dissolved and the floating hydrocarbons from the water. And then you're talking about treating the water. Desalination is, is one part of it, but you also have other constituents that you really need to take care of. You have some, some uh, you know, you might have some radioactive materials, for instance, in this water. Okay, so it, it's, it's, what's the cost, what's, uh, you know, the, the experience that, that we had is that, you know, we're talking about the range of, of uh, uh, right now, what uh, the oil company is paying, like 50 cents per cubic meter, 45 cents per cubic meter, as a subcontract to a third party, but this water is, again, is low in TDS. It's, it does not have, uh, you know, uh, uh, major problematic elements. Uh, the, the, the oiling can be, uh, and they are using the oil that's recovered to subsidize part of the cost. So, and they are coming up at 45 cents per cubic meter and it's quite profitable. But once we're talking about 400,000 cubic meter, uh, 4, 400,000 PPM, it's, 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 it's a totally different ball game, and it's, 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 uh, nothing can be economical over there. Okay, somebody else who wants to contribute? I would just say when, you're, when it's the, there's the discussion earlier about you know, what you're going to use, with the, um, whether it's going to be for water flooding or trying to increase the recovery ratio of your hydrocarbons, there's two strategies. One's the produced water, and then one would be using seawater. And so the, on an economic basis, the produced water is clearly by far the most challenging. So the thought has always been it's great when you're in a region that you've got tremendous amounts of oil and gas, and you have all this water that's coming up. The challenge is it's the many different ways in which you have to go about trying to get it into a state where it can be re-injected. So with seawater, for instance, you know, removing the sulfates and bringing it to a level where you can actually use water flooding techniques and the like, we, it's something on the order of maybe 10 cents uh, per barrel 
of recoverable hydrocarbon is what you're looking at. Produced water, though, of course, you know, it's probably going to be something around six to ten times more simply because of all the challenges that there are in, in, that, uh, in that process of getting it pure enough to be re-injected. Uh, thank you. And I also want to, uh, now we are almost on the, at the end of our discussion, and uh, I want to uh, raise another question which can be answered in a, perhaps in a future discussion here, panel discussion. For example, uh, we talk about now the costs now, but we also have to consider long-term impacts. We, we talk about, about impacts here. When you talk about desalination, for example, what is the long-term impact on the, on the ecology uh, uh, while you are disposing the brine in the sea? And this is something which also has a long-term effect. And this should be also considered in our integrated uh, or holistic approach here. And this is not yet done so far. And I think these issues also should be um, uh, considered in our discussions and about our strategies and our management system we have to um, use in our uh, in uh, treating uh, this uh, water issues here. And so from this point of view, we still have 10 seconds. And as I see, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for uh, these few contributions. And I hope you were interested in this issue or we get, you get some interest in this issue. And perhaps we can stress this next time. And I think we should focus only on one issue and then we can have a more structured discussion here. Thank you for the panelists for coming and for their valuable contributions. Thanks for coming and now enjoy your lunch.